In the late 1940s and early 1950s, John Reginald Halliday Christie, better known as Reg Christie, was an English serial murderer and suspected necrophile. 10 Rillington Place, Notting Hill, London is where he killed eight people, including his wife, Ethel, by strangling them to death in his own home. During March of 1953, shortly after Christie had left Rillington Place, the corpses of three of her victims were discovered in a wallpaper-covered kitchen nook. He found the bodies of his wife and two other victims under the front room floorboards and two more in the yard. Christie was convicted and executed for the murder of his wife, for which he was sentenced to death. Beryl Evans and her infant daughter Geraldine, as well as Timothy Evans, Beryl's husband, were all tenants at 10 Rillington Place in 1948-49 when they were murdered by Christie. After Evans was charged with both crimes, convicted guilty of the murder of his daughter, and hung in 1950, the case aroused massive debate. A significant prosecution witness, Christie's own crimes were found three years after Evans' conviction, raising severe questions about the integrity of the case. Since then, it has been widely believed that the police mishandled the initial investigation, and allowed Christie to go undetected for four more murders, allowing him to kill Beryl and Geraldine, as well as four other women. After determining that Evans did not kill his wife or their kid, the High Court overturned his conviction in 2004. John Christie was the sixth of seven children, born in North Orham near Halifax, in the West Riding of Yorkshire. It was difficult for him to get along with his father, carpet designer Ernest John Christie, who was stern and uncommunicative with his children and harshly punished them for trivial infractions. John's mother and elder sisters, on the other hand, tended to coddle and bully him at the same time. It wasn't until later in his life that Christie's childhood friends identified him as being a queer guy. After a protracted illness, David Halliday, his grandpa, passed away on March 24, 1911, at the age of 75, at Christie's home. At some point in the future, Christie remarked that seeing his grandfather's corpse sprawled out on the table gave him a sense of power and well-being. At the age of 11, Christie was awarded a scholarship to Halifax Secondary School, where he excelled in mathematics, especially algebra, his favorite subject. Additionally, he had a strong background in both history and woodworking. Christie's IQ was eventually discovered to be 128. He was a member of the church choir as well as a scouting troop. Sometimes in North Orham, Christie attended Boothtown Council School, also referred to as Boothtown Board School. On April 22, 1913, he graduated from high school and began working as an assistant projectionist. Impotence was an issue for Christie since he was a teenager. His first intimate encounters ended in failure, and he was labeled can't do it Christie for the rest of his teenage years. His intimate problems had persisted throughout his life, and he was limited to performing with prostitutes almost exclusively. Christie's genitals were confirmed to be physically normal in a post-mortem examination. Christie joined the British Army in September 1916, he was called up on April 12, 1917, to serve as an infantryman in the 52nd Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Regiment. As a signalman with the Duke of Wellington's, West Riding, Regiment, Christie was sent to France in April 1918. While at Calais in June, he was wounded and spent a month in the hospital after being poisoned by mustard gas. This incident, according to Christie, has left him unable to talk clearly for the rest of his life. In his later years, he claimed that the assault had left him deaf and blind for three and a half years as well. It was said by him that his time of muteness was the cause of his inability to speak more than a whisper for the rest of his life. Even if Christie had lost his voice upon admission to the hospital, he would not have been released as fit for duty, according to Ludovic Kennedy. Christie had no record of his blindness either. He was unable to speak loudly because of the psychological effects of the gassing, according to Kennedy. To get sympathy and attention after the assault, Christie would exaggerate or seem to be sick, and this was a symptom of his personality disorder. On October 22, 1919, Christie was discharged from the military. On December 13, 1923, he enlisted in the Royal Air Force and was dismissed on August 15, 1924. Ten days later, on May 10, 1920, at the town's register office, Christie married Ethel Simpson of the same city. In spite of his inability to reproduce, he continued to see prostitutes. Ethel had a miscarriage early in their marriage. A year and a half into their marriage, they broke up. Prior to working at the English Electrical Company on Thornton Road in Bradford, Ethel worked at the Garside Engineering Company. In Bradford on Ironbridge Road. Ethel and her siblings relocated from Halifax and Bradford to Sheffield in the year of Ethel's birth. When Christie first went to London in 1923, she was still living with her family in the Canadian cities of Halifax, Bradford and Sheffield. 
His release from jail coincided with the couple's return to Rillington Place in January 1934. As his marriage to Ethel wore on, Christie was convicted of a number of crimes. He began working as a postman in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on January 10, 1921, and was sentenced to three months in jail on April 12, 1921, for stealing mail orders on February 20 and March 26. On June 27, he was released from imprisoned Manchester after serving his term. After that, on January 15, 1923, Christie was found guilty and sentenced to 12 months of probation for acquiring money under false pretenses and aggressive behavior. On September 22, 1924, he was sentenced to three and six months in jail for two further theft charges he committed in 1924. On May 13, 1929, Christie was sentenced to six months hard labor for assaulting Maud Cole, whom he was living with at 6 Almeric Road in Battersea, after he had worked as a lorry driver for more than two years. He had hit Cole over the head with a cricket bat, which the magistrate described as a murderous attack, for which he was sent to imprison Wandsworth. On November 1, 1933, Christie was sentenced to three months in imprison Wandsworth after being found guilty of automobile theft. Christie and Ethel were reunited in 1934 as a result of Christie's incarceration being overturned. His criminal activities had been curtailed in the short term, but he continued to seek out prostitutes. In 1937, Christie and his wife relocated to Notting Hill's 10 Rillington Place, then a rundown neighborhood of London, and settled in the top floor apartment. In December 1938, they moved into their ground floor apartment. There were three floors, and it was erected in the 1870s, during a time when the region saw an influx of property speculation, which resulted in a lot of poorly maintained and unimproved multi occupancy rental properties. The ground and first floors of number 10 shared a kitchen slash scullery. However, the second floor apartment only featured two rooms, a kitchen slash living room and a bedroom. This was due to an adjacent addition. The tenants of the building shared one outdoor latrine, and none of the apartments had a bathroom. Residents of 10 Rillington Place would have heard deafening train noise from an above-ground portion of the Metropolitan Line, now the Hammersmith and City and Circle Lines. Christie sought to join the War Reserve Police after working for three years as a foreman at the Commodore Cinema in King Street, Hammersmith, and he was approved despite his criminal record. In the Harrow Road Police Station, he met Gladys Jones, with whom he started a relationship. When the woman's husband, a serving soldier, returned from the war in mid-1943, their relationship ended. After finding out about the affair, he rushed to his wife's residence and attacked her lover, Christy. During a 10-year span from 1943 to 1953, Christie strangled and indecently assaulted several of his victims after he had knocked them unconscious with home gas. Ruth Fuerst, a 21-year-old Austrian munitions worker and sometimes prostitute, was the first victim Christie acknowledged murdering. Christie claimed to have met Fuerst at a snack bar in Ladbroke Grove while recruiting clients. On August 24, 1943, he asked Fuerst over to his house for intercourse, according to his own testimony, his wife was visiting relatives at the time. As a result of this, Christie hung her from his bedpost and then suffocated her to death with a piece of rope. It was originally hidden under the living room floor, then buried in the backyard the next night. At the end of 1943, Christie resigned from his position as a special police constable after the death of a fellow officer. He worked as a clerk at a radio plant in Acton, Massachusetts, the following year. Muriel Amelia Eady, a co-worker, was his second victim. A week later, he summoned Edie back to his apartment with the promise that he had devised an extraordinary concoction that may treat her bronchitis. Using a tube, Edie was able to inhale the mixture from the container. Christie used Fryer's balsam to mask the odor of household gas in the combination. Edie was sitting with her back to Christie as she breathed in the mixture through the tube with the gas tap connected to a second tube. In the 1940s, home gas was coal gas, which had a carbon monoxide concentration of 15%, and Edie ingested it as she continued to breathe. Prior to her burial, Christie indecently assaulted and strangled Fuerst. Rillington Place was the new home of Timothy Evans and his wife Beryl during Easter of 1948, where Beryl gave birth to their daughter Geraldine in October. Evans reported his wife's death to the police in late 1949. Beryl, Geraldine, and a 16-week male fetus were found in an outdoor washhouse after a police search of 10 Rillington Place failed to locate her body. Both a blanket and a tablecloth were used to encase Beryl's corpse. Bruising on Beryl's face indicates that she was physically abused before her death, which was discovered during the postmortem examination. As a result of interrogation by authorities, Evans admitted to killing Christie's wife in a botched abortion procedure. As the statement appears fabricated and artificial, 
The police may have made up the alleged confession to murder in order to get the suspect to confess. Evans retracted his confession and accused Christie of both killings once he was charged. Prosecutors opted not to pursue a second charge of murdering Evans' wife when he was put on trial for his daughter's murder in 1950. Christie was a key witness for the Crown, denying Evans's accusations and providing detailed evidence about his and his wife's arguments. Despite the fact that Christie had a history of stealing and violence, the jury decided to convict Evans. As originally planned, Evans' execution was postponed until February. Evans was hanged at imprisoned Pentonville on March 9, 1950 after his appeal on February 20 failed. On May 21, 1946, Christie began working as a grade 2 clerk at the post office savings bank in Kew. When his criminal background came to light, he was fired and left on April 4, 1950. A femur was later found propping up a fence in the garden of Rillington Place, where the remains of Christie's previous murder victims had been overlooked by the police. Beryl and Geraldine's corpses were located in the property's garden, which was only 16 by 14 feet, 4.9 by 4.3 meters, and had a fence that ran parallel to the washhouse. After Evans confessed to burying his wife's remains in the drains, three police officers conducting a search of the house did not enter the washhouse. Although the garden seems to have been inspected, it has not been excavated. It emerged that shortly after these police searches, Christie's dog unearthed Edie's skull and dumped it in an abandoned bombed-out house nearby. No systematic search of the crime scene could have turned up this or any other human remains that would have implicated Christie in the crime. When it came to managing forensic evidence, many police investigations into the property were at best superficial. Searches may have saved the lives of Evans and four other women if they had been carried out properly, exposing Christie as a killer. Builders working on the house were ignored, and their various interviews with Evans suggest that the police fabricated a false confession. On November 30, 1949, Evans made his first statement in Merthyr Tidville, Wales, in which he stated that he had no idea where his wife's body was buried or how she had been killed. An investigation by police found no trace of his wife's body, which he had claimed to be in an unnamed manhole or drain at the front of the house. When the two bodies were discovered in the washhouse, it should have prompted a thorough search of the house, washhouse and garden. However, no further action was taken. Evans was likewise completely ignorant of his daughter's death when he gave his first interview. Mishandled from the start, the police questioning in London began by revealing to him that they had located the clothing of his wife and infant at the washhouse. Keeping this information from him would have forced him to reveal where the bodies had been buried. There are a number of confessions that contain words and phrases that seem out of place for a distressed, uneducated, working-class young man like Evans and bear no resemblance to what he said. According to statements made by Ludovic Kennedy long after the truth about Christie had been revealed, they were probably definitely creations manufactured by the police. Christie's comments were taken as truth by the police and he was an important witness in the prosecution of Evans. Christie's testimony was taken at face value by the cops, according to Kennedy's account, and no further inquiry was carried out. Considering that Christie had criminal convictions for stealing and intentional wounding, whereas Evans had no prior convictions for violence, the reliance on his evidence was questioned. Prior to meeting the Evanses, Christie had claimed to be an abortionist, telling a colleague in 1947. The following day, he repeated this claim to women he met in cafes, whom he may have considered future victims. Using this tactic is in line with the methods used by Christie to gain women's trust and entice them back into his apartment, as demonstrated by Edie. After Evans' trial, Christie went nearly three years without a major incident. As a clerk for the British Road Services at their Shepherd's Bush Depot, he began work there on June 12, 1950, and quickly found another job. First and second floor rooms at 10 Rillington Place were quickly filled by new tenants. Christie and his wife were horrified to learn that the majority of their neighbors were black immigrants from the West Indies, they both harbored racist views of their neighbors and disliked living with them. When Ethel sued one of her neighbors for assault, tensions between the new tenants and the Christies rose to a boiling point. It seems that Christie was able to get a deal with the poor man's lawyer center that would allow him to keep the back garden to himself, purportedly to keep his neighbors at bay, but more likely to keep the human remains buried there safe. The morning of December 14, 1952, Ethel was killed in bed by Christie. Two days before, she had not been seen in public. Several theories were developed by Christie in order to explain his wife's disappearance and prevent further inquiry. It was revealed that Ethel had rheumatology and could not write, to one of his neighbors, she was visiting her family in Sheffield when she was in Birmingham, and to another, he stated she had gone to Birmingham. On December 6, Christie resigned from his position and has been without a job since. For the sake of his financial well-being, 
he sold Ethel's wedding band and watch for two pounds tens on December 17. On January 8, 1953, he was paid 11 pounds and 25 pence for furnishings. Cutlery, a mattress, two chairs, and a kitchen table were all that Christie had in his home. Christie earned a weekly unemployment compensation of three pounds twelves from January 23 to March 20. He falsified his wife's signature on January 26, 1953, and drained her bank account. Christie sold some of his wife's items for three pounds fives on February 27, 1953. Bradford Clothing and Supply Company also sent him a check for eight pounds on March 7. Kathleen Maloney, Rita Nelson, and Hector Anna McLennan were all killed between January 19 and March 6, 1953 when Christie invited them back to 10 Rillington Place. From Ladbroke Grove, Maloney was a prostitute. Nelson, who was six months pregnant at the time of her death, was visiting her sister in Ladbroke Grove from Belfast when she met Christie. Christie and McLennan met for the first time at a cafe while McLennan was visiting London with Alex Baker, her boyfriend. Christie allowed McLennan and Baker to remain at Rillington Place while they were seeking for a place to stay while they were in town. Another time, Christie went to see McLennan alone and he convinced her to come back to his apartment, where he killed her. Afterwards he told Baker, who had come to Rillington Place in search of McLennan, that he had not seen her, Christie maintained the ruse for a few days, meeting with Baker often to see if he had any information about her location and to assist him in the hunt. Christie used a rubber tube linked to a gas line in the kitchen to gas his last three victims, he kept the bulldog clip shut to keep the gas out of his victim's eyes. As soon as the clip was removed from the tube, gas began to seep into the room. Despite Christie's claims to the contrary, the Brabin report found that Christie's description of his gassing approach was insufficient since he would have been overwhelmed by it. However, all three fatalities were found to have been exposed to carbon monoxide. Christie used a rope to strangle his victims when they became sleepy from the gas. Edie and Christie both indecently assaulted their final three victims while they were unconscious and continued to do so until they died. Christie immediately became known as a necrophiliac once this part of his crimes was made public. According to the statements Christie provided the police, he did not engage in intimate activity with any of his victims entirely after their death. One critic has advised against designating Christie a serial killer. A vest or other cloth-like material was inserted between each of the last victim's legs before Christie indecently assaulted their semi-naked corpses in blankets, similar to the way Beryl's body was wrapped, while their remains were being stowed in a little recess behind the kitchen wall. This alcove's doorway was subsequently wallpapered by him. Having falsely rented his property to a couple from whom he received £7.13 0D, £7.65 or nearly £215 as of 2019, Christie left 10 Rillington Place on March 20, 1953. The landlord arrived the next night and requested that the pair leave as soon as possible since he hadn't seen Christie. Once Beresford Brown had been granted access to Christie's kitchen, the landlord permitted the tenant of the top floor unit to use it. After trying to install brackets for a wireless set in the wall, Brown found the kitchen alcove. Brown noticed the corpses of Maloney, Nelson, and McLennan as he peeled down the wallpaper. Police were alerted and a citywide hunt for Christie was launched after confirmation from another renter at 10 Rillington Place. Christie checked into a King's Cross Road and house using his true name and address after leaving Rillington Place. The news of the finding at his flat leaked on the 24th of March, and he was forced to leave London the next day. He traveled the city, sleeping on the streets and spending his days in cafes and movies. His watch was sold in Battersea for 10 shillings on March 28. All that Christie had with him when he was detained on the Putney Bridge embankment was a wallet, some money, his marriage certificate, and a newspaper clipping regarding Timothy Evans's detention and custody. He had no ID with him at the time of his arrest. After he was taken into custody, Christie acknowledged solely killing his wife and the two ladies in the alcove. On learning of the bones dug up in the backyard, Christie also acknowledged killing them. During the police inquiry in 1949, Timothy Evans was first charged with the murder of Beryl Evans, but on April 27, 1953, he admitted to the crime, even though he maintained that he had not killed Geraldine. However, Christie admitted to a hospital orderly after his trial that he may have been responsible for her death as well. Speculation has claimed that Christie would not have wanted to acknowledge his culpability in Geraldine's death out of fear of alienating the jury and for his personal safety from the other convicts in his cell. When Christie confessed to the killings of Muriel Edie and Ruth Fuerst on June 5, 1953, the authorities were able to use that information to identify the women's bodies. Only Ethel Christie's murder was prosecuted against Christie. Evans' trial was held in the same courthouse on June 22, 1953, three years after the start of his own trial. 
claims of insanity and a lack of memory were made by Christie. The prosecution brought Dr. Matheson, a prison psychiatrist who assessed Christie, as a witness. He said Christie had a histrionic personality, but he didn't think she was mad. He testified that. After 85 minutes of deliberation, the jury rejected Christie's defense and declared him guilty. Christie made the announcement on June 29, 1953, that he would not be appealing his conviction. Evans' mother asked him to confess everything in a letter to Christie dated July 2. George Rogers, Christie's MP, interrogated him for 45 minutes on July 8, 1953, about the killings. David Maxwell Fife, the Home Secretary, declared that he couldn't find any justification for Christie's reprieve five days later. Dennis Haig, a former army buddy of Christie's, was one of Christie's last visits, along with the prison governor and Christie's sister the night before her execution. It was on the night of George Rogers' execution that Christie declined to meet with him for a second time. On July 15, 1953, at 9 a.m., Christie was hanged at him prison Pentonville. Albert Pierpoint, who previously hung Evans, was the one who executed him. Christie claimed that his nose was itchy when he was confined to a chair awaiting execution. It won't trouble you for long, Pierre Point told him. The corpse was buried in the prison's grounds after the death penalty was carried out. It's been suggested that Christie committed more murders than only those at 10 Rillington Place based on his collection of pubic hair. Despite Christie's claims to the contrary, only one of the four hair clumps he kept was from his wife, Ethel Christie, and the three corpses found in the kitchen alcove. A single unaccounted for clump of hair remained, it could not have originated from Beryl Evans since no pubic hair had been removed from her corpse during the autopsies, which had taken place by this time. This is what one of Christie's forensic pathologists, Professor Keith Simpson, had to say about the collection of pubic hair when he wrote it in 1978. In light of this, it's odd that Christie claimed the hair came from skeletons in the alcove when in fact it was taken from the bodies there. It's also odd that the only trophy Christie took from a victim in his last four murders was from the one woman with whom he did not have perimortal intercourse. And it's even stranger that one of Christie's trophies had come from none of the unfortunate women involved. None of Christie's victims have ever been tracked down, even by looking through records of missing women in London during the era when he was active in the city. Michael Edo said that as a special police constable during World War II, Christie was in a position to conduct much more killings than have been uncovered. Jonathan Oates on the other hand thinks Christie had no additional victims because he believes the killer would not have varied from his normal technique of murdering if he had done so at home. Many people were outraged by Christie's conviction, which was based in large part on testimony from Christie, who had resided in the same house where Evans was accused of committing his crimes. Despite the fact that Christie never admitted to or was charged with the murder of Geraldine, he was generally believed to be responsible for both Beryl's and Geraldine's deaths at the time. This, in turn, raised questions about the fairness of Evans' trial and the likelihood that he had been executed while innocent. Because of the issue, David Maxwell Fife, the then Home Secretary, ordered an inquiry to be conducted by Recorder of Portsmouth John Scott Henderson QC to ascertain whether Evans was innocent or if a miscarriage of justice happened. Henderson examined 20 other witnesses who had been engaged in any of the police investigations before he was executed, in addition to Christie. Christie's admissions to the killing of Beryl were found to be untrustworthy and given in the aim of bolstering his own defense that he was crazy, according to Evans. To no use, concerns about Evans's guilt or innocence continued to be raised in Parliament, as did media campaigns and publications that made similar assertions. Many people felt that the Henderson inquiry was biased against Evans' innocence since it was conducted in such a short time span, one week. The fact that Evans and Christie lived in the same house at the same time if they were both found guilty of strangulation fueled speculation that the trial of Evans had been tainted by error. In the winter of 1965-1966, a second inquiry was initiated under the direction of High Court Judge Sir Daniel Brabin because of this ambiguity. The evidence in both instances was thoroughly reviewed by Brabin, who also looked into the claims of Evans' innocence. A more probable than not finding was reached in this case, Evans may have murdered Evans' wife, but it is unclear whether or not Evans also killed Geraldine, who died at the hands of Christie. To avoid drawing attention to Beryl's absence, Christie presumably killed her since doing so would have raised the likelihood that his own crimes would be uncovered. A jury could not have found Evans guilty beyond a reasonable doubt had Brabin tried the case again because of the inconsistencies in the evidence. The Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, based his recommendation on these findings to award Evans a posthumous pardon since he had been convicted and executed for the death of his daughter. On October 18, 1966, Jenkins informed the House of Commons that he had granted Evans's pardon. When Evans' remains were returned to his family, 
they arranged for a private cemetery to be established for him. The issue of whether or not the death sentence should be retained was already being discussed in the United Kingdom. Because of Evans' execution and other contentious instances, death punishment was suspended in the United Kingdom in 1965 and eventually abolished. Evans' half-sister Mary Westlake and his sister Eileen Ashby received ex gratia monies from the Home Office in January 2003 as restitution for the injustice of his conviction and sentencing. Lord Brennan QC, the Home Office's independent assessor, said there is no evidence to incriminate Timothy Evans in the death of his wife and the conviction and execution of Timothy Evans for the murder of his child was unjust and a miscarriage of justice. Christie was most likely the assassin who killed her. Given Christie's admissions and conviction, Lord Brennan thought the Brabin reports finding that Evans probably killed his wife should be disregarded.